So very simply, if we want to conserve angular momentum, L, and there is a change in inertia, how mass is distributed, then you must change the location of the spin axis. So arguably, the basic physics of true polar wander are quite simple um, compared with plate tectonics. And in this cartoon that Dave Evans nicely illustrated, you have the plumes uh, wanting to be on the equator and the slabs wanting to be on the pole. Now, in reality, because the mantle is stratified by density, uh, the reality is a little more complicated uh, than that. Um, but uh, this works as a sufficient approximation. And more importantly, uh, this is a global thing. So you shouldn't think of one plume or one slab driving true polar wander. It's really the globally integrated inertia. And just for reference, there's a link at the bottom uh, on YouTube where you can watch true polar wander actually happening um, in little experiments that people do in space. Uh, you can't do this on Earth because we have the gravitational vector uh, always dragging you down. Um, so something you can check out later. Now, uh, what is the inertia tensor and how might it relate to uh, supercontinents and, and mantle convection? So Earth is not a perfect sphere. And in addition to the, uh, the hydrostatic shape due to rotation, where the equator radius is, is bigger than the poles, um, Earth is also uh, kind of shaped like an American football uh, or, or a rugby ball. So the inertia tensor here, you have uh, the three uh, tensor, meaning three axes. Uh, you have a maximum, minimum, and intermediate uh, uh, principal moments of inertia, okay? And because of mantle convection on Earth, as Zhang Shihong here has illustrated very nicely, uh, Earth has this prolate uh, or football-like shape. So today we have the two LLSVPs, the large uh, low shear wave velocity provinces uh, underneath Africa and Pacific, here shown as these yellow upwellings. And that, uh, those upwellings really control the location of this minimum moment of inertia. So the minimum moment of inertia is actually the true polar wander axis, and as you add mass or take away mass due to plate tectonics and mantle convection, because these other two moments of inertia are quite close to each other, uh, the simple addition of a little mass or subtraction of mass can cause the intermediate and maximum uh, inertial axes to want to change. So to sum up, uh, Mantle convection controls both the, the location of the true polar wander axis, the minimum moment of inertia, as well as the angle, how much true polar wander occurs. Now, we don't have to just look at Earth um, if we want to see if true polar wander is indeed a real phenomenon. And in fact, looking at the solar system, at other planets and moons, we see a lot of evidence for true polar wander. So if you look at Mars, you have the largest gravity anomaly in the entire solar system, the Tharsis Magmatic Province, a huge large igneous province, Richard, uh, that is sitting squarely on the equator. And this could be coincidental, uh, but there's also uh, other independent evidence that suggests that Tharsis is on the equator because true polar wander rotated to put it there. Um, and the Saturn's moon Enceladus, you have this buoyant uh, geyser coming out of exactly the South Pole. So uh, it has been argued that that uh, buoyant positive, uh, um, negative mass anomaly wants to be at the South Pole. If you look at uh, Jupiter's moons, uh, you have these ph phenomenal uh, deformational structures on the surface of Europa, and they have systematic patterns um, that can be explained uh, almost due to what they call membrane tectonics, uh, due to true polar wander. 
And if you look at Io, there is a systematic distribution of volcanoes and mountains, different types of mass anomalies along longitude. So on these other planets and moons without plate tectonics, it's actually quite straightforward interpreting um, the record of true polar wander. But back to Earth. Earth does have plate tectonics. And because of that, uh, if there is true polar wander occurring, it's gonna be more difficult to detect. And one of the most useful methods to detect uh, true polar wander is paleomagnetism. So many of you already know this, uh, but the magnetic field is a geocentric axial dipole where the inclination um, is directly proportional, uh, sorry, the inclination of the magnetic field lines uh, are directly proportional to the latitude of a continent. So as continents move, uh, the inclination and latitude change. Now, uh, the uh, magnetic field is generated in the core. So the fact that true polar wander is actually rotating above that, uh, that means that paleomagnetism, uh, just like it does for plate tectonics, paleomagnetism provides a stable, uh, unaffected reference frame internal to what's happening in the lithosphere due to plate tectonics and what's happening in the whole uh, silicate earth due to true polar wander. And I should also mention that the magnetic field is axial symmetric. It's identical at every longitude. There's nothing special uh, over long periods of time. And true polar wander, um, has a way of breaking that symmetry because it occurs around a certain axis right on the equator. And this will become useful for us. So just a very brief history on uh, how uh, we have come to understand true polar wander on Earth. So before, long before the plate tectonic revolution, uh, you had Charles Darwin's son, George Darwin, uh, a very smart physicist. You had Lord Kelvin uh, and even Alfred Wegener um, considering um, true polar wander uh, to be potentially geodynamically important. And I would just point out that there's been this historical back and forth between TPW theory and the geologic evidence. Um, Sometimes when the theory seems to support it, there doesn't seem to be geologic evidence for it. And when there's geologic evidence for it, uh, the theoreticians seem to come up with new reasons why uh, it's very unlikely. And uh, starting with George Darwin, um, this is again pre-plate tectonics, even pre-continental drift. And the main argument that Darwin and Kelvin had is uh, in order to have these large shifts in the spin axis, you would need large shifts in the surface weights of the crust to produce it. And because they were thinking of Earth as very fixed and rigid, um, they thought that uh, there wasn't a forcing for true polar wander. So fast forward, and uh, the French, luckily to the rescue, uh, with the Service uh, International, uh, Latitude Internationale, the International Latitude Service, they decided to set up uh, um, uh, astronomical observatories at one line of latitude, the same line of latitude to observe the same stars. And what they saw over decades was that Japan moved systematically south. California moved to the north. Maryland moved even farther to the north. Uh, Italy moved very little, and the location in the USSR then moved uh, to the south. So they could fit this beautiful sine wave um, where you had Earth rotating systematically about one axis that comes out near Africa on one side and the Pacific plate uh, near the other. And the rate of this motion is around 10 centimeters per year. Uh, this is actually faster than any continental plate is moving tectonically. And uh, we now know even more precisely, so starting in uh, the 60s 
when we started launching satellites, we can measure even more precisely uh, the true polar wander is happening. So the summary here is true polar wander is happening. Uh, geodetic data tell us this with confidence. And in fact, uh, satellites have detected in the last few decades that the long-term, century-long constant direction of true polar wander towards Greenland has in recent decades actually taken a right turn um, right towards the Greenland ice sheet. And this is most likely due to the mass redistribution as you melt Greenland and the lithosphere uh, bounces back. So uh, true polar wander is affected by all masses on the planet and on very short time scales, it can even be affected um, by glacial, uh, glacial effects. Now, going back to uh, geological timescales, uh, we should keep in mind that right at the beginning of the plate tectonic revolution, you had uh, kind of this tension developing uh, between either continental drift or true polar wander. And, you know, scientists, we're best at testing one hypothesis. And although this paper was very forward looking, in identifying paleomagnetism as a good test of these hypotheses. Uh, the truth is, is that paleomagnetism measures both, both plate motion and true polar wander. So in the subsequent decades, uh, we've had the difficulty of trying to define each of these components. And of course, the plate tectonic revolution uh, was very convincing, um, almost independently, of paleomag, you have the uh, isochron seafloor spreading record, uh, so lots of evidence for plate tectonics. So in the mindset of, oh, either true polar wander or plate tectonics, if you embrace plate tectonics, maybe you can discard true polar wander. But luckily, uh, by the end of the, true, of the plate tectonic revolution, uh, you had some smart geophysicists point out that actually, in fact, the operation of plate tectonics um, moves masses in the mantle, um, here depicted as these crawling beetles. And as these masses will move around the sphere, um, it's almost inevitable that you have to have uh, the whole sphere shift. And plate motion, oh, sorry, paleomagnetism measures apparent polar wander. Apparent polar wander is the combination of a plate's movement, the continent you sampled, plus the true polar wander. We measure both the crawling beetle and all the beetles shifting together. So Earth is complicated. So let's discuss some of these controversies. I won't go into detail uh, because most of the people are interested in older times. Um, but even true polar wander in recent times is always controversial. So Rich Gordon showed with data from the Pacific Plate about a 13 degree shift in the paleomagnetic data over a very small amount of time. The speed of this motion seemed to be so rapid that it was very difficult to explain in terms of plate tectonics. So he proposed true polar wander. And then in science, uh, a decade later, um, almost a similar hypothesis, again with data from the Pacific Plate, found about a 16 to 20 degree shift in the paleomagnetic data uh, between two poles uh, that were indistinguishable in their age. So as little as four, maybe as much as 10 million years, we have a very large shift in uh, apparent polar wander which they interpreted as true polar wander. But of course, uh, nothing with TPW is without controversy. And Rory Cottrell and John Tarduno uh, had a comment, late Cretaceous true polar wander, not so fast. And then on to the next controversy. Also in science, we have Joe Kirschwink and David Evans um, showing that the paleomagnetic data from Laurentia and from much of Gondwana uh, seem to show about a 90 degree shift in the location of the paleomagnetic poles. And interestingly enough, that shift seems to be occurring right around the time of the Cambrian explosion. 
Um, again, not without controversy, uh, Tron Torsvik, Joe Meert, and others uh, argued uh, about some of the data quality, data selection, uh, and we had a very public uh, back and forth uh, about this event. So I myself, in the years since, uh, followed up uh, this debate in, in two aspects. First, I followed it up by generating some new data, since the data were called into question. Uh, when you have a shift in your paleomagnetic direction, you need to be able to rule out uh, more simple explanations, such as some tectonic, local tectonic rotation, or in paleomag, uh, what we call re-magnetization, where the age is, not, is much younger um, than the age you think it is. So we went to one stratigraphic section. Um, actually, Professor Lee uh, helped uh, Dave Evans with this sampling. And what we found is in one stratigraphic section, uh, we see, as Kirschfink had predicted, about this 60 or 90 degree uh, rotation. Can't explain it by tectonic rotation locally, can't explain it by remagnetization. And when we compared our new data to the rest of the data from Gondwana, uh, it seemed to be consistent with this rapid motion right around the time of the early Cambrian. And I also contributed in terms of the theory, uh, if there is a link to surface evolution, uh, there's much more life around the equator. This is called the latitudinal diversity gradient. And if true polar wander systematically rotates the continents, those continents moving towards the equator should experience new species origination and those towards the pole should experience extinction. And indeed, uh, continents like Laurentia uh, that have a rich fossil record seem to have moved towards the equator uh, where continents uh, like West Gondwana, um, which do not have a rich fossil record, move towards the pole. Now on to the next controversy. In the Ediacaran of, uh, in the Ediacaran of Laurentia, there was a very peculiar observation where some of the paleomagnetic poles were high latitude, uh, plotting far from the continent, and some uh, on the continent, sorry, and some were low latitude, plotting far from the continent. So uh, you'll see in the literature the high latitude or the low latitude options. Uh, but the truth is, is through time, uh, you, you have an oscillation from low latitude to high latitude and back to low latitude. Now there's also evidence from Laurentia of a pretty impressive large igneous province that has been interpreted as a plume. And uh, remember our equation, apparent polar wander is plate motion plus TPW. If you want a even, uh, if you want a fixed plume or even a quasi stationary plume, you can't have a majority of this apparent polar wander being plate tectonics. Otherwise, the relationship with the plume would be severed. However, if we interpret most of this uh, APW in terms of TPW, you can keep uh, uh, the relationship with the plume as well as explain the paleomagnetic data. So here we use the hotspot track as our tectonic reference frame to control for uh, the tectonic part of the APW equation leaving the residual as, as true polar wander. And I should say that Boris Robert, a member of IGCP 648, has done a magnificent job of uh, following up uh, this Ediacaran oscillation by testing it on other continents. Remember, true polar wander is a global phenomenon, so it shouldn't just rely on data from Laurentia. And indeed, what he showed is, as Baltica seems to show the same oscillation, uh, West Africa seems to show a similar oscillation, and also not shown uh, Australia. And I'd also point out that by overlapping these paleomagnetic poles uh, in order to uh, make this oscillation, you actually have controlled for the relative longitude of Laurentia and Gondwana. So even though Laurentia and Gondwana were not connected tectonically, because of this stable true polar wander axis, you're actually uh, controlling the relative longitude between these blocks. 
Now on to another controversy, uh, still further uh, in uh, Earth history. Um, there's known as the Bitter Spring Stage, a very confusing uh, sudden shift to negative carbon isotope anomalies. And Adam Maloof uh, had the idea of sampling paleomagnetic data from below the shift, during the shift, and above the shift. And what he found, interestingly enough, is there from one to two to three, there is this oscillation in the paleomagnetic direction that seems to correlate quite well with the oscillation in the carbon isotopes. Additionally, um, in thousands of meters, kilometers of stratigraphy, there is also only two major sea level changes, those occurring at S1 and G1, where the paleomagnetic shifts occur and where the carbon isotope shifts occur. So Trupor Wander, uh, because it rotates the continents um, through the hydrostatic bulge, it can actually cause uh, sea level changes as well. We've known this since Alfred Wegener's beautiful uh, drawing here. If you move towards the equator, you move into the hydrostatic bulge and experience transgression. If you move out of the hydrostatic bulge to high latitudes, you move out of the hydrostatic and lower, uh, and, and the sea level experiences regression. Professor Lee has also uh, shown um, that it's not just uh, Svalbard or Laurentia or Australia, it's also South China um, uh, indicating this rapid shift. So uh, a neat example of other ways to test true polar wander completely independent of paleomagnetism. And uh, even farther back in time, we're now Orosirian. This is the age of Nuna or Columbia supercontinent forming. And uh, a, a fascinating array of paleomagnetic poles. Uh, Ted Irving thought that maybe we could explain these poles uh, and their dispersion due to vertical axis rotations just locally. Um, but if you look at the paleo current measurements going up and down systematically, the basin axis, it's very hard to explain all of the data through vertical axis rotation. So I myself have preferred a true polar wander interpretation uh, and others working in Amazonia and other cratons have also seemed to find other shifts. So let me just summarize some of the lessons that we've learned uh, and also some implications. So just going through the time scale here, uh, I, um, I looked at any potential candidates of true polar wander events. Where do we see rapid or oscillatory uh, uh, shifts in apparent polar wander that are difficult to explain in terms of plate tectonics and could be possibly better explained by true polar wander events. Now, here you see almost maybe 30 uh, events. Um, whether that is an underestimate or an overestimate is very difficult to tell. Um, but I would admit that not all of these events uh, have as rigorous evidence as the instances we talked about today. But I should point out um, in the Paleozoic, uh, Mesozoic, sorry, Tron Torsvik has done a great job. Uh, Dennis Kent has done a great job showing um, about 30 degree true polar wander events. Remember the Cambrian, we have this 60-ish uh, degree event. The Ediacaran, we have these 90 degree events. Um, around 800 million years ago, uh, we have a 60-ish degree event. Um, and remember in Orosirian, Paleoproterozoic time, we had again these 90 degree events. And just taking these, these shifts at face value, uh, we see a very interesting change through time where you have large amplitude, 90 degree like events during supercontinent assembly, and you have less than 90 degrees, uh, 60 or 30 during periods of supercontinent tenure and breakup. And this probably relates to the fact that supercontinent assembly has the most slabs uh, sinking in very random places all over the globe as continents collide and you have uh, slabs avalanching and sinking. 
So actually supercontinents, uh, once they form uh, and break up, seem to stabilize the spin axis and limit the amount of true polar wander. And the last thing I would uh, just point out in terms of implications is as well as relative longitude, uh, if we interpret the true polar wander axis as these long lived mantle upwellings or LLSVPs um, as it is today, we have the true polar wander axis squarely in the center of the African LLSVP on the top. Um, if we interpret the true polar wander axis in older times, uh, we can actually see uh, this shift. Um, uh, and we argue that there's a 90 degree shift in the LLSVPs, uh, which we refer to as orthoversion. So in addition to relative longitude, maybe true polar wander can even tell us about absolute longitude and supercontinent dynamics. So just to summarize in my last minute here, uh, what are the four lessons uh, we've learned? Number one, true polar wander is a very testable hypothesis. There's no excuse uh, not to uh, be, there's no reason not to be skeptical um, because uh, the test should be uh, positive on every continent. So the global test of reproducibility is always there. And also, uh, you know, uh, plate tectonics can only go so fast. Uh, we have number two, this rate test of tectonic incompatibility. It can only bend a slab and subduct it so quickly. And true polar wander is less restrictive in its rate limits. So we have the test of rate. And then there's these independent tests. We have the hot spot track giving us the plate motion. Uh, we have the sea level changes, the carbon isotope changes, and also local structure, uh, if done properly, can help us understand whether the paleomagnetic data uh, need a more complicated explanation. And fourthly, true polar wander is useful. Uh, it's very useful as a longitude reference frame. Um, whether it's just relative longitude, which paleomag typically doesn't have. And if it is happening as much as it may be happening, uh, our understanding of surface evolution through time uh, is really underestimating the potential contributions uh, if we only think about plate tectonic contributions. And lastly, I think in terms of connecting uh, the uh, plate motions to the mantle, uh, uh, true polar wander has a very uh, large insight in potentially telling us about supercontinent cycle dynamics. So my conclusion is even if true polar wander is a ghost that is hard to see, it is a friendly ghost. <laughs>